and our ability to uh, work towards the center is becoming much more difficult. We seem to be on the extremes and the challenges that this country faces are ones that uh, the extremes generally don't work and it's somewhere in the middle that's the result. Yet our political system and our leaders in our political system seem to be working in opposition to that. How do we get back to the middle? That's a good question. How do we get back to the middle? You know, I, I wish I had a great, fabulous answer for that, um, but I do think there needs to be, in any, any time that there's problems in any relationship, and in a way, that's kind of what we're having right now, problems between, up on the Hill, different Republicans and Democrats, that some way there needs to be a way to have conversation, to build those relationships. And the other thing is, I think you have to be willing to understand what you're asking someone to give up. And this is the tough one in healthcare right now because what we just saw in Massachusetts is going to scare many members of Congress who now believe if they vote for healthcare in the second iteration, they will lose their seat. So it's something that the President and the White House and others have to be conscious of. What are we going forward? How do we explain it? properly to the country and how do we take, how do we, how do we understand what we're asking, do we understand what we're asking people to give up, and then how can we find a compromise, you know, to start to say win-win. I mean, one of the things we were talking about earlier is how do you do health care in little pieces? Because this may be too much for the country, it appears that it is, so maybe we could back up and say let's take, let's, you know, take pieces of it that will help people be more comfortable um, to find ways to come up with win-win solutions. Because what happens, you stop compromising when one's a win and one's a loss. And I think that that's the this down part of what we just saw happen in Massachusetts, because now members of Congress are going to run for the hills, so they're going to be convinced that they're going to lose. So I think there has to be a kind of this continued dialogue to figure out what can we do. We might not be able to do the, eat the whole apple, but we could take a bite. And, and that's one of the things I've learned in leadership, too, is sometimes when you're trying to make change, and you have to understand, if I'm asking you to make change, if I understand what I'm asking you to give up, and to not, be, not going in blindly, and, and not being aware of what those consequences are. But I would be, I, I know other people in this audience have other um, ideas for that as well. You know, one of the things Obama did is, in our campaign is we will not take any money from corporations or PACs. So going forward, you hope that maybe politicians will continue to go to the American people to help fund their campaigns, stay away from that. Um, we, you know, the average donation in our campaign was under, was under $200, and uh, the majority of those were under $100. So people all over this country were willing to give five dollars, ten dollars, um, and I, I remember um, in one town hall meeting in Kentucky, this woman stood up and said, "said I don't have any money. I barely make ends meet." But when Barack Obama um, gave his race speech and was willing to talk truth to the difficulties in our country, I gave you five dollars, and to her that was a lot of money. And so we saw that over and over again. So I hope that other, you know, going forward that campaigns can continue to inspire people to contribute in small amounts of money. And because it's not so much in what we saw in our campaign, it was the numbers of donors that mattered. And, um, and going, that Supreme Court nomination is a very that big backtrack and very dis disillusioning. First, thank you for coming. Um, when will your book be out? And how do you deal personally when another person in the same position of leadership is not willing to compromise? So when my book is coming out October, and any of you will have, after you've heard me speak, any of you that have an idea for a title, my website is BetsyMyers.com, and um, if you, if you, anyone who comes up with my title, 
there'll be a big surprise for you. <laughs> and, um, but um, so my book is coming out in October. It's, it's uh, published by Simon and Schuster, and uh, and then um, but what, I'm sorry. What was the second? How do you deal personally when other people aren't compromising? How do you deal personally when other people aren't compromising? In sports? What winds you down? Oh. Aggravated at the what winds me down? We all have our own ways of winding down, don't we? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what I have learned is um, over time is we, we all grow and mature and we all skin our knees and we all fall down and we all have moments where we learn. And I have learned that when I have trouble working with people to... Um, here, here's a learning thing that I learned, and Erskine can probably relate to it. <laughs> Sorry, this is horrible, isn't it? Um, um, I used to, um, when um, I would, it, um, if someone wasn't compromising, I would say, well, okay, I, just, I won't work with you because someone over here will. And that doesn't really, you know, that won't take you that far. I used to say, who gets it and who doesn't, right? Because sometimes you, don't, you can't ignore someone who is not in your corner. And what I have found over time in maturing as a leader myself is that actually that old saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, that by building relationships with people who don't agree with you is so important. And... Um, oftentimes, it is just the mere fact of trying to have a cup of coffee with someone who might not be in your corner is, seems like such, it's such a little thing, but one quick example, when I was running the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard, I came in as the new executive director, and the woman who had been the executive director before me had written 12 books. I was not a PhD, I was only a master's. She was a PhD, very prominent leadership scholar. I came into the center. She continued to stay there, but as head of research. And we were taking the leader, the, the center in this new direction, on personal, in a personal leadership direction. She thought the center should be more um, academic, more research-based. Not an uncommon right, issue in academia. And when I first got in there, I thought, well, she's not really cooperating. She's kind of, you know, she, she has different ideas. And I really just kind of chose to, you know, with all my energy and making things happen, ignore her. Well, that wasn't a very smart thing to do, um, because that never gets you anywhere. And then one day I decided, you know what, she's actually, she's got a lot of experience, and I'm going to build a relationship with her. And so I went to her office, I said, can we have lunch? And she said, sure. So we went to lunch, and I said, I'd really like to start over and see how we can, you know, we have very complimentary styles. They're very different, but very complementary too, because we bring different skills. And we agreed that day that we would have coffee or breakfast every two weeks going forward. And she became one of my closest advisors in the center. And I realized I had not written any leadership books. She'd written 12 books. And she knew a lot. And we agreed that how could we work together instead of working apart? And it was the simple notion of, hey, can we have lunch? And not just one lunch, but can we follow up with coffee? There is nothing like building a relationship. Whatever problem you have, 90% um, of the time, if you go to somebody and say, you know, can we, can we have coffee? Can we talk about this? I'd like to start over. And what can I, you know, can you share with me what's upsetting you and, and see if you can build a relationship? That is the only thing that I, I personally have been able to, to say has helped me in my career when things are going rough. Um, and when I didn't try to build relationships is when it was not um, particularly helpful to me. You know, oftentimes, just to follow up to that, but oftentimes back to my premise in leadership, when people don't feel valued or seen and heard, is when they actively work against you, right? So... It, it's like with my relationship with, with the other faculty member, she felt that I didn't respect where she was coming from, and so she actively worked against me. 
But then once we were able to build the relationship, she became my teammate. So it's a really simple, so sometimes you have to step back and say, if I'm having problems here, you know, in this milieu that I'm working in, is somebody feeling less than valued? And what am I doing to contribute that? And that's the part of being conscious in your leadership. Be willing to look and say, what, what, what of this is me? And how can I fix it? It's just really easy to point fingers. But at the end of the day, we have a lot of control of our environment if we're willing to be conscious and reach out to people and say, you know what, you matter. And, and the other thing is, um, is saying thank you to people around you. It is so important when, you know, I always say, have you looked at your staff or your classmates or your siblings or your friends? Have you looked at them and really acknowledged who they are in your life? It's an amazing thing when you do that because it's, it's those little moments that matter, those little moments where people feel valued that they will be willing to work with you. And that's whether you're running a club or you're on a sports team or you have a little kid, um, you know, whatever it is, that that's our, really our basic human desire um, is to feel valued. Anybody have one last question? Yes. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for coming to ECU. My name is Deidre Nixon. Um, I just like to say I like to see women in leadership. I serve in multiple leadership positions. And I guess my question is, I was reading your biography because I wanted to make sure I know who you are. Um, you know, outside of being Obama's senior advisor for his campaign. Um, it said that you, prom you helped um, shape the administration legislative agenda on issues such as domestic violence, reproductive choices, breast cancer, and women in business. Um, can you explain the domestic violence? Like, what exactly did you help shape, like, go in more detail? Well, that was, as I was saying earlier, that that was something that President Clinton cared so much about. Mm -hmm. You know, he himself had experienced that as a child, and so it was one of the issues that he was willing to, to speak about. No other president has spoken out on domestic and sexual violence. He's the only one. Mm -hmm. And so part of what we did was... Um, work with him uh, on the issues of domestic violence. So, for example, we, working with um, the Department of Justice and Department of Health and Human Services, we started a 1-800 hotline number. And it was one of the things we did that's still going. And is there, we did that actually with, um, also with Senator Kennedy was involved in that as well. Um, and so that's one example um, of, and it was something that the President was willing to talk about as well. Um, it's a very difficult issue, and he was willing to use the bully pulpit. And as Jerry Rossi from Marshall said, that that was so important because it's, it's also changed the way you know, people talk about it now in mm -hmm. a way 15 years ago they didn't. I can't take credit for um, any of the domestic violence initiatives. They were really the president's initiatives mm -hmm. that I didn't support it. But he also, for example, in the crime bill, he added um, monies for education for prosecutors and police um, to, know, to be able to identify domestic violence mm -hmm. and to be able to deal with it. And so uh, in our courts okay. and on the streets, it's you know, improved, but we still have a long way oh, to yes. go. Because I asked you, because um, I'm the president of a new organization on campus, Voices for Victims. I don't know if anyone in here is a member or, you know, I'm just the president and that issue is something that really interests me yeah, a lot. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, we have a long way to go, and as um, you know, Jerry Rossi from Mar uh, TJX, uh, there's still, you know, but there's a lot of people working on it now. Yes. But thank you for your work that you're doing. You're welcome. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Sure. Um, I had three, um, three things I'd like to bring up. The first one, I offer my sincere apologies to those people who actually stood up and and we're not polite. My second one is, um, what, are your, what is your opinion about the amount of um, term limits for those people who tend to spend a lot of their time in office? And in some cases, they spend, they, it's almost as if they're in there for themselves in some cases. They might spend a little bit too longer than might be necessary in, in office. What was the first question? Oh, the first one was, I was just offering my sincere apologies to those people who had stood up while you were and doing your questions and answers. Uh, oh. I apologize for that. That's um, okay, I understand people have to go to class and stuff like that, so yeah, but thank you. Um, the third one um, I hope might be a little bit humorous, but you're asking for a title for a book. 
perhaps drawing from the story from your daughter, maybe freaking out with leadership. It certainly wouldn't be forgotten. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about the title, for those of you that I know are going to go noodle on this for me, um, they don't, Simon & Schuster does not want leadership in the title. Because, why is that? And that this is really interesting, isn't it? Simon & Schuster and the major publishing houses. Because books with leadership in the title don't, don't sell because most people, two, two reasons. One, most people don't see themselves as leaders, which is why I'm saying to all of you, every one of you is a leader. And number two, people who are leaders already have all the leadership books and aren't that interested in any new ones particularly. <laughs> so that's, and I need a title that will attract both men and women. So some of the titles like Moments That Matter is people say, no, that's more females would buy that. So what's a title that would attract both men and women and doesn't have leadership in the title. So we have not been able, this has been over a year process and we can't, we have not come up with the title. So any of you, www.bettymyers.com and I promise a very big reward. Um, term limits, I don't, you know what, I, have, I, could, I could talk both pieces of that. You know, there are some fantastic public servants, you know, that um, should continue on and have a third term, or uh, fourth term, um, some of our best, and then they get cut off. Like, for example, in Virginia, they have a one-term governor, which is so ridiculous. You have four years and you're out, and you just get going, and you have to get every, all the work done. Um, on the other hand, we spend all our time trying to get reelected, and the money that it costs to get elected these days is also very troubling. I have so many friends that are running for office, and. Um, you know, what they have to do to raise money is very difficult. So that's a, that's a really tough issue. On the other hand, term limits, you get new blood and you get people coming into the system. So I think there's a win, it's a win-loss, you know, win-win or win-loss and both. You could talk either side of that issue. I want to say thank you to all of you who have uh, been so patient and uh, come today to share with me this afternoon. Thank you to my good friend Erskine. Um, it's so fun to look down at you down there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's a first for me. I've always been looking up. And um, no, but thank you. It meant a lot to me that you took the time to come. And the chancellor, thank you for hosting me. And uh, Dean Rick from the business school. Um, it's been a real privilege to be at this beautiful campus. And, um, and congratulations to the work that you're doing for leadership here, because I think you have an opportunity to be a model um, at this university for leadership programs and leadership thinking. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Betsy.